when we have about, I think, 10 or 15 minutes of on-stream Q&A time. Um, but you know, if there's uh, more questions than that, people are welcome to stay. Um, if Mike has the time to answer some more, then awesome. Yeah, I will be around for, um, I'll be around for the rest of the conference. So I am Spud PNDS, which is Spud Upside Down uh, on IRC, if you, uh, if you want to hit me up on IRC. Nice. I see we already have a question on the pad, uh, and it is, did you develop a variant of your document for CentOS? Uh, I did not. Uh, I have not messed with any um, other Red Hat distributions other than uh, Fedora. Um, I would like to expand the document out to uh, Windows and to Mac OS, as um, I think a lot of people really want to build Emacs on those platforms because it's much harder to get um emacs binaries running on those platforms although they're they're around on the internet it's not as bad as it used to be but building emacs is is very a very fun thing to do and i encourage everybody to do that right We're also getting comments from folks here on Big Blue Button, um, EXC or Matt saying, great talk, good demonstration of what's possible. And um, Aaron thanking Mike, saying awesome presentation, and they missed the first few minutes and have to rewatch and uh, to get the portion that they missed. I had a hard time cramming the entire talk into 40 minutes. Um, so I, I spoke quickly. Uh, I have a feeling I may have left some folks behind who weren't paying close attention. So uh, rewatching my might might help yeah. oh nice i noticed matt uh said that he helps maintain the shell functionality in or babel and last march they added async evaluation into session code blocks very cool especially when you're doing something that takes a long time it would be nice if emacs wasn't locked up i, I will definitely have to check that out I, uh, I use this technique at work a lot, um, like when I write documents to how to explain things to uh, coworkers and such. And one of the things I had to explain was how to how to build um, AWS uh, MySQL databases and replicas and how to build them with very specific parameters to work with this system called Vitesse. And um, when I was running that document, uh, building these kinds of MySQL databases in AWS would lock up Emacs for you know 20, 25 minutes at a time. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm really excited about async evaluation. Totally. Oh yeah, uh, Python mode, uh, I think has had async for shell blocks for a while. Um, I think there's a third party package of Elba that adds async support for that. Um, but yeah, I, uh, it, I explicitly wanted to make sure that it would work with super vanilla stuff. Oh, it's built in, I see. Um, yeah, I'll have to I, didn't, I didn't realize it was built in for Python blocks. So I'll have to check that out. There's so much Emacs. It's it's hard to it's hard to wrap your head even around a tiny portion of it. It's it's such a deep topic. Uh, looks like uh, somebody on IRC said I can't wait to add some of this stuff to my documents, and that really makes me happy. I hope I hope people go out and write literate org mode documents that do amazing things.
when's the next talk? We have like, uh, let's see. I think we have about um, four or five minutes uh, live on stream for Q&A. Yeah, OK. Oh, here's a question. Uh, Blaine asks, uh, are you running Emacs from the host machine? And uh, yeah, so I'm running Emacs on the exact same machine that I'm building uh, Emacs on. And um, I, had, I had first thought about doing that over Tramp. Um, and I thought that would be a very cool demo to show how you could do that remotely on Tramp so you didn't need Emacs on the host machine. Um, but I, I decided it would be a lot easier. And as I ran into a deadline to get the talk completed, <laughs> I abandoned that notion for the straightforward approach. But uh, ideally, I would spin up virtual machines and then have, you know, using the org mode document and having org mode reach out to those machines via SSH and Tramp. Oh, yeah, there's also a little bit of discussion on IRC about org macros. Um, and you know how they made their way into the document. And I remember when I first discovered org macros by reading the org mode documentation, I was really excited because I thought I could uh, limit a lot of the boilerplate I end up typing. But um, as we discussed, org macros, I think only work in one context in your org mode document. And I think that's in the pros section. So you know you can't um, you can't resolve a macro inside a header arg, for example, or inside an options block or um, it would be awesome if macros worked everywhere, but um, I'm happy to have them just where, as they are now. Indeed, they're very convenient. Cool, and Blaine also says, uh, Thank you for showing what's possible with literate documentation. This is mind blowing. Yeah, I think so too. I I, uh, I first saw this technique in Howard's video, literate DevOps, and uh, I remember I was just picking up parts of my mind after it exploded after having watched that video. So uh, I wanted to do some of it myself, and that's where I came up with a, a couple different uh, approaches to that. Um, it's not just for you know making literate Emacs configurations. For sure. We have another remark slash question on the pad. Um, someone saying, great presentation. Uh, the preparation is outstanding. And uh, for someone like me that never touched uh, the orgmark side of Emacs, uh, what do you feel is the more complex part to tackle? Um, you made it seem simple, but the complexity there. Ooh. Yeah, um, just getting all of the configuration uh, set up the way you want it is the most is the hardest part. Um, so some of the defaults are, you know, they don't look good when you render them out in LaTeX and finally PDF. And there's a lot of work to be done to tweak the LaTeX environment so it looks um, as pretty as you might want it. Um, and then just org mode has a lot of knobs that you can tune and they have a pretty large impact on how your document is um, exported. So, um, I think the hardest part is just knowing what's possible and like uh, knowing where all the knobs are to tune and twist. Right. Got another question on the pad, and I think we have about a minute or so on the stream. So I'll read this question as well, but folks are welcome to continue uh, on the pad or just come join here on BBB after myself and the stream move on to the next talk. Um, yeah, and the next question is, um, how do you normally debug, for example, view the logs or see failed statuses uh, when the commands in the source blocks fail, um, especially if they output lots and lots of logs and you need to see the full history of the build? Yeah, so I see it in the messages buffer um, whenever I export a document. If there's a failure, that's typically where it's written to. And I will um, actually kill the messages buffer before I export. So I know that only the messages in the buffer are for my given export. Um, and I mentioned that debugging trick where you name all of your org mode source blocks. So if there is a problem in one of the blocks, uh, it'll actually tell you what the uh, block, uh, the name of the block the error occurred in. And if you don't do that, it just gives you a um, like a position number in the buffer. And whenever I tried to convert those position numbers to actual 
places where the error occurred, it was never exactly where I suspected it would be. So I found that very difficult in debugging. So the only real debugging tip I have is name your source blocks, even if they don't, even if you don't refer to them later. I think that's all the time we have on stream, and I also have to drop as well. But thanks again so much, Mike. And uh, folks are welcome to come here and um, continue discussion here. Thanks again.